Um, but I've been asked to talk about Palmer Amaranth Management and Peanuts. Are we winning the, the war? And winning or losing? And, and you see my name there, Eric P. Prosco. My middle name's Paul. I'm thinking of changing to Pigweed because that's all I seem to talk about anymore. It, and uh, I, I think, though, we are making some strides, and hopefully as, as we go through my presentation, uh, maybe you'll pick up one or two things that, that you might want to try. We have learned a lot about the biology of the plant that we, we sort of, I think we knew, uh, but because it wasn't such a big problem, we sort of had to relearn some of the things that were, were already out there. We've learned a lot about biology of the seed and how pollen moves and how tillage and cover crops influence the emergence of that particular species and we've learned a lot about herb herbicide efficacy. And we tie all these things together when, we, when we, we know more about all these things we can come up with a better package for managing the particular pest. And just, just think about the biology for example, knowing about seed production, when they produce seed, how long they live in the soil, how deep, how deep will they emerge if they're buried, all these kind of things. We've really learned a lot and that's helped us come up with better control programs for you. Now, so I, I would ask uh, this question, do we have the tools that we need to manage Palmer? And I would say yes, we have what we need right now. But it's not easy, cheap, or for the faint of heart. It's going to take a little work. But we, got, we got used to doing things a certain way, and then this pest came along because of what we were doing or not doing, and then now we have to change. Nobody wants to change that much. Uh, if you don't have to. But we're going to come back to this particular field in a bit, but I think that's a good example of, of uh, that we can manage Palmer um, if we do certain things. However, we do have challenges. And I think our biggest challenge, our two biggest challenges are, are these. Number one is irrigation rainfall. And about 50% of our peanut crop is dry land. And that's always going to be a challenge because we need moisture to make residual herbicides work. And nobody can make it. There's only one <coughs> entity that can make it, make it rain. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. If you've got irrigation, you're more likely to have success than if you're a dry land. But we, that's one of our biggest issues. And I'll, I'll share with you some, some interesting things about that in a minute. The other is what I would call farm size, weed size. You know, I think most of you have probably been to a county meeting. You've heard us talking about how important it is to spray weeds when they're small, and that's easy for me to say when I'm not farming 2,000 acres. So when we have a large acreage, and we know that pigweed, because we don't know the biology now, we know it can grow one to three inches in a day, we only have a two or three day window to be timely. So if you're a large grower, that's, a, that's tough to do, uh, particularly if you've got bad weather conditions when you need to make those applications. This is just an example of uh, one of the challenges that we face. I looked at the, uh, uh, the University of Georgia, if you don't know, maintains weather stations all across the state, at least for now. Um, and this data came from Albany, Georgia. From, uh, and what I did was look at the rainfall from 1971 to 2000, and I compared it to 2011. And if you look at the months of April, May, June, July, and several more, the blue bar is below the average. And so last year, we were well below average in rainfall. And for a weed scientist that needs moisture to get herbicides to work, or is it for a grower that needs moisture to get herbicides to work, that's a challenge if you don't have irrigation. Now here's a question that I'd ask, and this gets back to the farm size, weed size issue. How many acres can you spray in one day? What if it's windy? What if it's raining? We only have a two day, two to three day window to be timely. And I saw, I've talked to a few growers, and I've heard one tell me they can spray three, four, five hundred acres a day if things are going right. Um, and that's a good thing, but what if we have obstacles in the way? And that's a, that's a challenge. Our farm size is a challenge uh, for making timely applications. And this is just an example of, of um, how fast pig we can grow, and hopefully you're all aware of this now after eight years of us talking about pigweed. Uh, this is from one of my research trials. This is how big pigweed got in just three weeks after starting completely clean. And so you can, all of you, if you've been dealing with this issue already, you know that you can't blink your eye and it might be too late. Again, that's growth after 22 days um, and that will, uh, is quite significant. 
Now let's get back to this field. You know, most times if, if you're going to call your county agent and they're going to call me to come look at your farm, it's usually because something bad happened, right? Either got a problem or some kind of injury or had a failure in control or whatever it might be. And so I don't get to see good things all the time. But when I do, I like to take a picture and I like to talk to the grower, to the grower that I'm, I'm visiting and find out what did they do? What did this farmer do that maybe somebody else did or couldn't do or whatever prevented them from doing that? And I think if we look at some of the things that this person did, that kind of ties in the whole package of trying to manage Palmer. And probably the first, the most important thing, if it comes up, this is number one for me, is diligence. The first thing, when I asked the grower when we were walking around, I said, tell me what, I want to know what did you do out here to make this field look so good in terms of weed control. And the first thing out of his mouth, he said, Eric, I know that Palmer amaranth is a major problem. I am committed to doing what I have to do so it doesn't get to be like, I don't want to talk bad about anybody in Macon County, but like Macon County. Um, I'm going to do what it takes. I know we've got to worry about seed production. I know we've got to use residual. I know all these things. I've listened to what you guys are saying. I'm committed to doing it. And he started clean. That's probably one of our biggest challenges. If we go into a field where there's pigweed already up and are planting peanuts and they're 6, 8, 12 inches tall, we're probably going to lose. We're going to lose. So we've got to start clean. In this case, and I know not everybody wants to plow, but in this case, he used a moldboard plow. And we know from our research and the biology of the plant that if we bury pigweed seed deeper than four inches, it's not going to come up. And so we'll get about 50% control just from plowing. Now, that doesn't fit everybody's lifestyle, but in this case, uh, that's certainly one of the reasons why he got such good control. He planted in twin rows. Most of you plant twin rows for other reasons, like higher yields and better grades, but we do get better weed control with twin rows in general. Pigweed, another thing about the biology of pigweed, pigweed doesn't like shade. So if we've got twin rows, we've got more shade, we've got a little bit better control. He's got irrigation, obviously. You can see the pivot in that field. Um, he can make his residual herbicides work when it's not raining. He used Prow and Valor at planting. That's Valor's probably becoming our uh, war horse for uh, pigweed control, not only in uh, peanuts, but other crops. He made a timely cadre application, and timely for us, again, is two to three inches, not six, seven, eight, nine inches. He pulled it, he hand weeded. Anything that came through that program, there wasn't that many, he hand weeded. He, if, you, if you've been to some of our meetings, we've told you about seed production, you know now that one female plant can produce a half million seed at least. So going out there and pulling out that one or two that might have gotten by is a great way to, to battle uh, this pest. And in this case, uh, we don't talk about it much, but I think it's extremely important is his rotation with corn. You can see corn next to this peanut field. Having corn in a rotation, is there's other benefits, obviously, but because we can use herbicides like atrazine in corn, which is, which is extremely effective on pigweed, uh, that will help in the long-term management within the rotation. Now these next few slides are just a couple of uh, examples of basically if we talk about peanut weed control and pigweed right now, we've got two programs in my opinion. One I call the Valor Base Program. Uh, you'll, in the next two slides we'll have the untreated here and then these two rows all the way up into that alleyway were treated. This had Prowl and Valor out of planting and then Cadre over the top somewhere around 30 to 35 days after planting. You can see it's very effective for pigweed. You'll notice that we have a lot of pigweed in our research plots. The only other thing I would consider doing differently here, two things. Number one, if you felt you had a lot of ALS resistance, you could switch to something like Blazer or Cobra as long as you're timely. But you may also want to consider adding an application of Metolachlor or Dual uh, into the cadre to give you more residual later into the year. So the other program that looks very good in our program is what I call the Dual. It actually should be the Gramoxone Dual program or Paraquat Dual. Same thing, non-treated check. Got Prowl out at planting, Gramoxone Storm at Dual at 21 days after planting, and then we came in with Cadre and Dual again at 37 days after planting. And you'll notice here, unlike the other program, to try to make up for, uh, uh, to give us a little bit better residual, we've got two applications at Dual there. One at cracking time, one post-emergence. 
Now, there's a lot of issues that have come up about cadre, and if you come to the county meetings, we'll talk a little bit more about it. I don't want to address the cotton carryover today you know, for this meeting, uh, but we will in the county meetings. We've got some people that would like to grow their peanuts without cadre for whatever reason, and basically we have those same programs, and we would replace cadre in that case with either Cobra or Blazer plus Dual or Cobra in both situations either. Again, that's the Valor, Valor program or the Gramoxone program. Now we still will need, in the absence of cadre, we will have some issues. Uh, we'll have purple nut sedge issues if you still got those lingering around. And uh, we'll need DB in there to help us with uh, Cyclopod. Now what about the future? What's the future of peanut weed control going to be? And unfortunately, I'm, I'm sad to say that at this point it's kind of bleak. But right now, in the next few years, there's nothing new in terms of modes of action coming. We are looking at other products, and I want to reiterate that these that I'm mentioning to you right now are not labeled for peanuts. I'm not saying that you can use them in 2012. What I'm saying is we are looking into whether they could be used on peanuts or not. If you grow cotton, you're probably using warrant somewhere in your cotton program. Probably haven't heard of this one. This is soybean herbicide. This has got Valor in it, which we all know. And then there's a new herbicide uh, that will be marketed this year called Zidgewood, which contains pyroxysulfone and Fierce has that same active ingredient. That is a residual product for the control of grass. It also works on pigweed. So these are things we are looking at. There's some potential there. Will they ever make it to the peanut market? I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep looking. So we already have compounds that control weeds the same way these do. So what's the benefit of having them? I would argue that the more products we have, hopefully we can see some better competitive pricing uh, in the long run, but no new modes of action. And just an example, I, I just, again, just to show you what the potential might be, this is Fierce, this is Valor and, py and Pyroxysulfone by itself. That's the only thing that was done in that plot, and that's 81 days after planting. We'll see. Just a quick uh, blurb about non-selective applicators. Um, you know, we've been using those more in peanuts to help us with our pigweed, and we want to remind you that uh, we would only encourage you to use that as a salvage type of uh, treatment and not to rely on that. We've got some other tools out there. Hopefully you're doing it and uh, coverage is important. We're seeing right now in our research that we need to get at least 60 to 70% of that plant treated or wiped or wicked, whatever you want to call it, for those types of applications to be effective. I know there's some strip tillers out here. My colleague is doing a lot of work with what we call extreme cover crops. So if you want to do to, to, to reduce tillage, we can use rye cover to help us manage palma. Twin rows, multiple residual herbicides. If, you, if you've got irrigation, great. You should be able to do a good job controlling pigweed. If you're a dry land grower, it's going to be a little struggle. Timely posts, hand weeding, non-selective applicators, and if you can fit corn in your rotation, that's certainly going to help you. If you want to speak to me about anything in spe any more specific, I'd be glad to uh, visit with you.